Welcome everybody to the SAC's early stage and seat investment panel from the moderators uh, Karin Kleinhans uh, with LSP and uh, myself, Martin Pfister from HGF, Hightech Gründer Funds. In the next uh, 55 minutes or so, we will discuss with our bespoken panel and hopefully have time to take one or two questions from the audience. And uh, I think to start without any further ado, let's start with the introduction. Uh, please focus on your stage of initial investments, geography, your typical investment ticket size, and the focus area of your funds. Uh, and uh, I think we see this slide with the uh, panelists. Uh, and maybe Karen, would you like to start? Thank, thank you very much, Martin. And uh, it's an honor to co-host this panel today with you. Hi, everybody. My name is Karen Kleinhans. I'm a partner at LSP. Um, our, we have different franchises, uh, Medtech franchise, Biopharma franchise, and a Dementia Fund franchise. Um, normally, we do tickets of up to 60 million, uh, also smaller ones, depending on the fund size and the stage. And I'm very much looking forward to have the discussion today with our panelists. Thank you, Karen. Uh, Antoine from Travel Capital, would you like to continue? Thank you, Martin and uh, Karen. So uh, I'm Antoine Po. I'm a partner at Truffle Capital, which is a, a Paris-based uh, VC. We like to invest in uh, radical innovation, uh, including in medtech implant therapeutics. And we like to do company formation, often like with uh, a spin-off from academic research, where we would uh, uh, recruit the management, start with a licensing deal with a new co and then finance the company from very early stage to commercial stage, ideally. Perfect. Thank you, Henri. And uh, maybe next one would be Jennifer from Saroba uh, uh, Life Sciences. Sure. Thank you, Martin and Karen. Great to be part of the discussion. Hopefully next year we'll all be in Switzerland together and we'll be doing this live in person. Um, but my name is Jennifer McMahon. I'm a principal at Saroba Life Sciences. At Soroba, we invest across the life science spectrum, so in med tech and in therapeutics innovation, and we class ourselves as an early stage investor, so typically investing at Series A, Series B. Our geographic focus is Europe. We're headquartered in Ireland with um, a base in Paris, France too, but we do make select investments across the US and North America. And we typically invest between four to six million euro in a first round, um, and investing perhaps eight to 12 over the lifetime of an investment. So that's us in a nutshell. Thank you. Thank you, Jen. And uh, Henry uh, from the Healthcare, would you like to continue? So I'm, I'm Henry from, from Gilda Healthcare. Um, we're also a Netherlands-based fund investing broadly in some new healthcare companies. So everything from therapeutics to medical devices and digital health. Um, I think we define ourselves as stage agnostic, but it, um, really depends on the, on the particular sector the company operates in, but doing tickets kind of five to 10 million up to 30 million over the lifetime of the company. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Uh, Lionel from Early Bird, what about you? Hey. Good afternoon, everyone. Apologies for the mask. I'm at the airport, so you may hear some announcements. Um, so I'm with uh, Early Bird Ventures, uh, about a billion five hundred management and uh, 23 years of existence. Uh, we focus on healthcare at large. Uh, we are agnostic as to stage, so we create about a quarter of our companies, but we also do growth. Uh, our ticket size can be as low as a few hundred K when we start companies and up to seven, uh, and then we double that. So we can go up to 15, 20 over the life of investments. Our geographical focus is uh, mainly Europe, but we're open to uh, Israel and uh, the US on a case by case basis. Thank you. Thank you, Lionel. And Mark, would you like to introduce uh, Pharma Ventures? You are mute. So it always had to be one that did that first. Um, and, uh, yeah, so my name is Mark Andrews. I'm a managing director here at Pharma Ventures. So unlike my colleagues on the panel, I, um, while I used to be a, an investor myself, I'm actually now a corporate advisor. And uh, Pharma Ventures are a UK-based um, company that um, uh, advise um, uh, life science um, companies across the across the the spectrum from from early startup all the way up to the big multinational 
corporations and um, you know on the slide there as, as you can see we we specialize in areas of corporate strategy licensing m a and also um, fundraising perfect thank you mark and last but not least patrick uh, from industry fund yeah glad to see everybody thanks for inviting me to the panel as well really great to be here and as jen put hopefully we will have a drink or two next time we meet uh, live so very brief uh, industry fund has been around for four decades actually we we go to market as a deep tech fund where half of our uh, spending goes into life sciences so that's big part of our genes but science-based innovation is basically what, what we're backing. Typically, we are the first institutional investor in Stockholm-based fund, but but looking at you know initial tickets between two to ten. But we can also uh, go into growth stage. Uh, we just recently did a, a B round participation, for instance, in a vaccine therapeutic uh, deal. Um, and we we typically take an active role in the companies and try really to to shape them uh, to, to be able to to um, go global, uh, whether that's in technology, AI, uh, med tech, or or in therapeutics. Thank you, Patrick, and uh, maybe some words about HGGF. So we are the largest seed fund in Europe with about nine hundred million euro on the management. Currently investing out of our third fund. Uh, uh, always in the seed stage, companies up to three years of age that could be outside of Germany, but do something in Germany. Um, uh, we invest across all sectors, in the healthcare, from medtech, digital health, uh, chemistry, um, but also biotech and pharma. And the typical ticket size is uh, 600K in the first investment and up to 3 million per company over the lifetime. Uh, and uh, um, we also invest across other industry sectors, but that's not in life science team and not for the day. And uh, maybe to set the stage, if we can get the second slide, please. Um, uh, we would like to, you know, uh, set the stage with, uh, with some data uh, uh, from a paper by the Silicon Valley Bank uh, from uh, 2021. And there they highlighted recent healthcare investments, quarterly numbers. Uh, of deals and dollars raised. And this is uh, really striking. And what we see is that across all sectors, the tailwinds uh, from healthcare response to the pandemic drove a significant investments last year. Uh, and we all know during a difficult time, 2020, there was a record year with $15 billion raised across all health tech sectors and uh, uh, 42 of which were in the US. But the investment pace even intensified in 2021 uh, with more than 600 deals per quarter, as you can see. And uh, this was driven mainly by a strong interest in emerging biotech pharma technologies, lots of money goes there, but also new health tech solutions and care delivery models. Uh, Karen, uh, what do you think? Excuse me, I had a lag here. Sorry, could you repeat? Uh, Karen, would you like to add? That. Yeah, I think what we have seen in the last years in COVID has just um, uh, accelerated it is that uh, healthcare is an important part of our e everyday life, uh, society and worldwide interaction are hampered by uh, infectious diseases and other um, emergent events. And uh, that has just been a tremendous boost to our industry because uh, it is now worldwide known what we do and how we can help improve lives all over the world. Yeah. Not only in the biopharma sector, but also in diagnostics and tools, right? Exactly. Okay. You Perfect. have to test the COVID test. Everybody knows now what it is. <laughs> yeah. Well, thanks a lot. Uh, and with that, uh, let's kick off the discussion uh, with the first question. Uh, maybe we go back. The, yeah. Um, and this goes to first to Jennifer uh, uh, and Antoine and Henri. Uh, Henry, uh, what do you look for in early investment opportunities? Uh, can you maybe highlight this by giving an example? Of a typical, you know, seed series A or series B investment deal you have done recently, uh, Jennifer. Sure. Yeah, happy to kick off. So I guess when it comes to early stage investments, I mean, of course, all investors would like to see lots of clinical data, maybe an approval. You know, there's there's a checklist of things that would be nice to see. But when we're focusing on early stage, I mean, I think it it probably boils down to the three P's for us. There's the people, the product, and the protection. 
and the people you know you need passion what you're doing you don't necessarily need to have done this before we've backed some fantastic first-time entrepreneurs or ceos and management teams um but also the perseverance because as we all know you it's a long journey over the course of investment and you will of course hit headwinds so it's important to be able to persevere and pull together as a team then when it comes to the product um, it's differentiation. You know, how is this going to be positioned in the market and how is it different and better to what's out there at the moment? And then the fourth, the third even being protection. So, you know, IP is a tradable asset in our industry. It's really important that you have protection or at least a, a plan for protection over the outset um, of the investment journey. So that they'd be the core things that we look at. And in terms of a recent investment, um, actually, that's also a P. We, our last investment was in a company called Pagliari, which is an Irish medtech company. And it's an insufflation technology. And um, insufflation is, it's a pretty generic tool that's actually used in pretty much all laparoscopic surgeries. And it essentially just inflates the cavity. And um, we learned that there were huge shortcomings in the existing technologies right there. And also this is, it's coming along the same time as there being massive concerns about smoke evacuation in the operation room. So the technology which Pagliari has, in, has developed is a novel insufflator that has real-time pressure sensing. Um, it's better for the patient in terms of clinical, out, clinical outcomes. And it's also much better for the OR staff, particularly the nursing staff who spend the vast majority of their time in the OR. And they've been exposed to a lot of noxious gases over the course of previous surgeries. And um, it was somewhat timely that they were FDA approved recently and they raised their Series A. As COVID sort of hit, we realized that not only are the OR staff um, oh, exposed to these gases, they're also exposed to all sorts of infectious particles that might be within the cavity. And um, so it was a very timely investment. And um, the team were a great team who have previously exited to Medtronic with their previous company, uh, Crossbond. So overall, um, it ticked all of our, our boxes and we invested in June this year. Thank you, Jen. Antoine, how about you? You go much earlier. Yeah, I would very much agree with the, the, the criteria that J Jennifer has just, uh, just mentioned and maybe pro providing an illustration on, on what we do and because we, we do company formation from academic research. So the criteria are sometimes even more stringent because at extremely early stage. So what we are looking for to basically transform a, a startup into a, a world leader is first what we call a radical innovation and a radical innovation addressing a life-saving indication. So what is for us a radical innovation? It's a, it's a scientific breakthrough that can really transform medicine or surgery. And when you will publish your first pa paper, the clinicians and KOL will say, wow, I've never, said, I've never seen that. And, uh, and I want to learn more about this technology. Uh, second criteria, as, uh, as Jennifer mentioned, is obviously a, a team and uh, finding for a, a stellar team. Uh, it means a, a team that is extremely recognized in, a, in, a, in the field, in our field, uh, but also not only a team we want to work with, a team of people that are, uh, that are committed, that are transparent, that are uh, passionate by, by, by their field. And, and I would say a team that won't necessarily tick all the boxes. So this is a, some important point. And finally, of course, IP, we want very broad and strong uh, claims in the patents and a long lasting uh, IP with, uh, with freedom to operate, especially, especially in med tech. Uh, as, a, as a good illustration of a, of a project we've started, uh, I would mention our company, Holistic Medical. So we met uh, this, uh, this team at Harvard and the MIT uh, led by Ellen Roche, uh, and uh, she had uh, uh, designed this uh, transcatheter patch that can close a small hole within the heart septum. Uh, and this patch uh, is light activated and uh, can adhere even in, uh, in the blood uh, flow. So this is uh, many challenges that, uh, that the, the, the company has at the, at the beginning, and we are, we are now uh, six months from uh, first in human, but I would say the, the, the technology and now the company uh, would uh, clearly meet uh, those criteria. And we've decided to, uh, to position this company on PFO closure. So it's a major medical need, basically ischemic stroke. So you will prevent uh, stroke recurrence by closing the, the PFO. 
and we are extremely happy with the, the progressing of, uh, of this company. So again, those uh, three criteria were, were met. Well, thank you so much, Antoine. Um, maybe going back to uh, Jennifer, to your um, example, what level of data did you really want to see before you invested? Sure. Well, I think, um, you know, we'd all love to have lots of data. And in, in the case of Pagliari, we actually did have quite a lot of data. Um, the technology had completed a first in human study in about 33 patients, and they'd managed to do so over the course of about six weeks um, in two Dublin hospitals. So it was also really impressive to see the rate of enrollment and recruitment in that trial, given that we were all and pretty much all of our portfolio companies have been hit by slow recruitment rates over the course of the pandemic. So that was another nice thing to see. Um, but from a data perspective, I mean, I think as medtech investors, we previously used to get comfortable with, you know, a prototype stage, perhaps design free stage of medtech development. But unfortunately, like, that has gone a little bit later. And our preference is to see first in human data. Now, it doesn't need to be 30 patients. It's, you know, 10 is fantastic. Um, but I think what we've learned in recent years, and unfortunately, lots of medtech investors have done the same, everyone tends to be going a little bit later where possible, because unfortunately, the timelines to exit have extended. So if you look at the data in 2019, I think the average time from Series A raise to exit was about eight years. Um, you compare that to biotech, which is, you know, three, four years, and there's a stark difference there. Now, I think the data did improve in, 2000, in 2020, which is great. It came down closer to five years. So I think if that were to continue that, that trend, um, we would be more confident that earlier exits are, again, um, a possibility as investors. But we have decided to go that little bit later and to focus on companies with first in human data where possible. Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, Henry, how, how do you see that? What kind of data do you want to see? Do you prefer platform approaches? How do you tackle this? Yes, so maybe also to, uh, to agree with the, the fellow panelists to give an example. I think for, for Gilda, the stage is really kind of relevant to um, the strategic interest. Um, and so for an example, in a company we invested in is Volta Medical, which is a, a French-based company where we led the Series A. Um, and they have a device that is a software guidance system to treat electrophysiology, um, so where the physician should have laid. Um, and they had a significant unmet need here, so persistent AF patients have something like 50% recurrence rate. Um, and for this company, they showed with this, this kind of tool that these clinicians have developed, they get the high 80-90%, um, so really kind of massive change in, in the unmet need. Um, so for us, that was really the kind of key there, this really strong early clinical data supported by the high levels of strategic interest in the space that kind of led us to do this early investment in, in the space. Okay. So, um, Patrick, I hear for medtech companies, at least a lot of clinical data is uh, nowadays needed to convince investors. How do you see that? Yeah, and I shouldn't call it out, call us out as a specific medtech investor. I think we take a broad. Uh, we we see a big convergence happening <laughs> between therapeutics hardware actually and software and AI, uh, and I think lately we've focused a lot around therapeutics and health tech. Uh, so actually, when we looked at that chart previously, health tech has overtaken biotech investing on the private side in the Nordics over the past five years, which is quite interesting. So if we take health tech and, and digital, um, for sure we, we want to see clinically validated product um, and some sort of market proof. So I think that that's within that segment, we want to see you know fair amount of data that really validates that the product can drive outcomes in the patients. And that's kind of the thesis we take into digital. In therapeutics, we're very much stage agnostic. So we can take on a, a preclinical asset if it's in a really paradigm shifting, cutting a research project. Um, to we we joined in a B round on a strep, uh, streptococcus uh, vaccine um, project 
uh, fairly recently together with the syndicate and other international investors. Obviously, uh, you know, carrying phase 1B data, uh, you have a, a certain level of insights into, uh, you know, what the phase 2 program will look like in phase 3 eventually. Um, I will also call out a different area, which is synthetic biology, where we've developed kind of a thesis, which combines hardware software and we see a big disruption coming into the life sciences sector here in dr drug production and the way you actually, you know, the, uh, the, the entire production cycle works. Um, so that's a different area where we've done a recent investment in a company called Enzyme, um, where we had different types of proof points we wanted, right? IP, definitely a core basis, but also validation around how the you know, production process works with our um, platform technology uh, and the proof points around initial applications uh, of the platform. Okay, that's interesting. So that uh, goes to my next question. I mean, these are groundbreaking new therapies mixing with um, innovation that maybe is an improvement of what we already have. So how to discriminate what is too early and maybe Lionel, what is too early for you? So, so I mean, this is a, a question, but I think it's related to the prior one is, you know, how much data is needed? Um, no, again, depending on the, uh, the healthcare sector where it's MECTEC, diagnostic, healthcare IT, and then and 2T20, you no, know, it, 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 it varies uh, for us. Um, no, if, if I look at uh, MedTech, for example, uh, first, we do not like uh, incremental. We like more revolutionary, something that brings something really new to the market. Mm -hmm. And uh, no, we usually ask for a working prototype and some you no know, basic animal data to make sure that uh, actually works. I mean, often we have people coming to us with ideas, right, sketches and so on, uh, but they have never assembled the device. So that for us is, is too early on that front. Uh, if I look at it from a diagnostic point of view, uh, no, too often do we have people coming to us with uh, retrospective data, which is nice, uh, but not sufficient. Uh, as we all know, no, between retrospective and perspective, it's, it's, it's a completely different world. Um, and we like to see prospective data. Uh, we also, especially in the diagnostic front, no, really also pay particular uh, attention to the uh, IP strategy, uh, especially in the molecular diagnostic as an example, because no, people tend to forget how complex the IP situation is in uh, you no know, uh, molecular diagnostic. But when we look at at you no know, uh, biotech as an example, another example here again, whether a small molecule or large molecule, whether it's a first in class or a fifth in class, uh, you know, the level of of data we need uh, also you no know, varies. It also varies uh, with indication. I mean, we all know that some of the indications. Uh, to develop them all along the clinic to a point where you can say it's really risked uh, might be longer than the life of the fund. Uh, so, so we have to be, for example, think cardiovascular, metabolic diseases, CNS, pain. Uh, these are very long, very large, very expensive trials. So uh, no, what really drives is, is not only the stage and the, the, the technology risk, the clinical risk, the IP risk, but also the time to exit because you no, know, our funds have no uh, ten-year life. You no, know, add a couple extensions, and I think you no, know, as was said earlier, um, you no, know, our investments, you no, know, the holding time used to be in the you no know, good old days, you no know, three to five years. You now, if you're lucky, you no, know, it's five to seven, but I would say it's closer to seven to eight or more. Um, so, and in, instead, also we pay particular attention to a time to exit. Um, as to the things in the test. So, and that again might be completely agnostic from data. Um, so it, it, it's, I realize it's, it's a very circumvoluted uh, answer to a simple question, but it is not a simple answer. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Lana. And so the simple question I posed you, I, I know that, and sometimes it is hard from the outside to understand when to, to contact you and, or when not. So I don't know, Martin, HCGF. Yeah, by definition, as seed investor, we go very early. Uh, and in biotech, this shifted from, you know, a couple of years ago, we definitely wanted to see data in mice. Uh, and now we, as most of you maybe, you know, look at uh, companies or projects that are hit to lead or, or have a lead. 
a candidate. Uh, so this went very early. But uh, maybe to add uh, an area that, that Lionel didn't mention, uh, digital uh, health. Uh, we look at a lot of digital health companies and have a portfolio of almost eight companies there. Um, and there the, they have to have, even if they are early and with a, you know, some pre-beta versions of their software, uh, they, have, they have an idea about their business models, who pays for them, and if, if they have talked to some payers. So um, the, 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 the market in Europe is very fragmented. Uh, and even if you now in Germany have this, uh, this uh, DIGA, um, where you can, you know, almost like a drug, if you're a drug uh, then approved by, by the, the, the legal authorities here and get paid for at least a year and you show data from, from uh, market analysis, and um, you have to have an idea how this works. And then this is, uh, uh, so the project can be very early, but this, uh, you know, who pays for it uh, is an important question, even for us as a very early stage, uh, stage investor. Thank you. Um, and, uh, you know, we are at the partner conference here. So, um, and of course the question occurs, so what is the, best way to get in the door and starting dialogues with, uh, with all of you. Um, so what would be things that uh, people should avoid? What would be good things? And what is the best way to reach out to you? Uh, Karin, uh, LSP is a large investor. Uh, how to reach out to you? Yeah, uh, the best way to reach out to us is by email or to in COVID times now that uh, hopefully we will go back to face-to-face -face interactions also at a conference, just um, you know, walk up, try to get a meeting with us. Um, from a general point of view, I always recommend companies to reach out to our juniors. They are highly motivated. They are screening the field. They are out there all the time, 24-7 and really hungry for new in innovation and um, making contact with new companies that have interesting stories to tell. Uh, they are all reporting um, into the project meeting, so everything is going to be seen. The, of course, you can also reach out to, to everybody at LSB, just look at our website and write us an email. Very happy to, to take the call or to um, look at the development plan. Sometimes be with us. It is extremely crazy since COVID uh, hit us. Our industry is in hyper acceleration mode and it can take a little bit of time sometimes to get back. And um, please be with us and just to be persistent. Perseverance, as uh, Jen said before, is very important also in reaching out. <laughs> Henry, how about you? How about Hilda? Yeah, so I'd say the, the best way is just to reach out to me and then uh, you're, you're directly in contact. Um, but yeah, I think other than that, it's again, emailing anyone from the team that I myself are very res responsive. I think um, it's also great to make your presence known at conferences like, like this and raise, raise your profile that way. I think as a, as a fund, we like to kind of deep dive in certain segments as well. So if we're doing a, you know, a heart failure deep dive to make sure you're kind of at the representative clinical conferences and you're, you're known in that kind of community as well. Um, but yeah, as Karen said, obviously there's a, a lot of um, companies we have emailing us, but we try and make sure we, we respond to them in a, in a timely manner, but there are obviously some delays that can happen with that. Um, but yeah, I think that the best way is being re reaching out to us or either having an introduction through one of our portfolio companies or fellow investors as well. And so anyone wants to add or anyone using an, you know, one of these active sourcing approaches here or? Uh, yeah, so in terms of um, active source, uh, of course, our, as we are, we are going to uh, universities and uh, tech uh, transfer offices to, uh, to reach, uh, reach out and, uh, and, uh, and analyze their recent uh, IP. But we are also, of course, uh, considering uh, uh, emails from, uh, from uh, uh, entrepreneurs. So I would recommend entrepreneurs uh, when they reach out that they send like very short email, very specifically uh, targeted at, uh, at our fund and how it fits with our investment strategy. Uh, and also in a few words, like why their product will be uh, ultimately superior to the existing products or the products in, de in development. Often they, they are tempted to send uh, probably too long uh, uh, emails describing like all the strategy and the uh, fundraising and so on. But I would, uh, I would recommend to, to make a very short and, uh, and uh, 
and uh, really uh, really strong email and persistent as well is very important. <laughs> Lionel, yeah. Like yeah, I to... <clears throat> yeah, no, I, I want to say something. I want people to keep in mind that uh, you no, know, per year we get hundreds and hundreds of business plans. You no, know, every day we get you no know, at least a dozen. So you no, know, it's it's more than we can. It's like drinking from a fire hose. So if if we get a, a business plan or something through our network. No, uh, someone from another fund we know and like and have been co-investing with says, no, boy, do I have a deal for you? We will pay attention. If someone we have worked with in the past or a former CEO, a former no, uh, um, employee of a company we know no, contacts us and we have an established relationship, we will pay attention. So really try to, don't, cold emails rarely lead to anything, no, but try to find a way to get our attention because you are one of so many every day, it's really difficult to, to, to re-triage. So, but no, if someone we know, no, makes the introduction, we will pay attention. Martin, the only thing to add there, I totally agree with what Leonella said, uh, intros are always very helpful, but I'm finding more and more these days, people are sending their intro email with a link to their presentation. And we're always encouraged not to open links from people you don't know. So we actually don't get the deck. Um, so like a short and snappy PDF that doesn't, um, that will get through any sort of quarantine hurdles in terms of size, you know, take out all the massive images or uh, compress them. Um, but I would say also just don't send a deck in a link. That's a very good uh, point. Um, we also do not click on links, so please do not uh, add anything in links, but add as a PDF attachment. Very good. So let's go to the next juicy topic. What you, can you tell us about relevant trends in the overall market in proceed and early stage investment? Focus on you know, financing trends or business models, what do you see, Mark? I think we lost Mark. Mark is gone. Good. And fun. So I would say in term, term of financing, uh, we need like to have like a critical uh, financing from day one uh, for all those companies since they are very uh, early stage and the risk is high. We want to uh, capitalize on Plat technology platforms. Uh, so to, why to develop like multiple indications from one platform? Sometimes you have a, uh, the first therapeutic indication, which uh, eventually uh, uh, doesn't work, but the second will uh, will work. So it's very important to deploy enough financing early on to uh, have at least two or three different uh, programs. First, I would say that. Second, to uh, to raise as much uh, uh, non-dilutive funding from uh, from day one so uh, in france we are we are lucky to have a very good system where you can get as much as a one euro of uh, non-dilutive funding for one euro invested uh, in equity and third uh, of course this uh, uh, financing has to be uh, uh, really uh, uh, efficiently uh, uh, used in those uh, companies to uh, to again reduce the cycle of development because time is absolutely key especially in uh, in med tech, where the, the commercial de, uh, deployment can be can be slow, so uh, so so a very significant and uh, and uh, and uh, well sized financing is absolutely key, especially early on in companies and also uh, at uh, mid to late stage uh, that we see now with uh, with the emergence of crossover and late stage fund, being able to sign uh, 20 to 50 million checks would be uh, also key to. Uh, to, for a successful deployment of the, 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 the all the products, especially in Europe. So, Patrick, could you agree to that? No, for sure. And I think uh, we we work actively both our, with our portfolio and with uh, com cases that we look at and are interesting to ensure you know strong syndic strong syndicates. I think across the life sciences sector, you know, it's a capital intensive business. So you better work with good parties. And parties that are synced. So I, I guess I mean, trends-wise, I guess we're all seeing a very hot market, right? So whatever was uh, a seed round uh, uh, a few years ago, or an A round a few years, years ago, is a seed round now. And also, a lot of companies are obviously looking at dual tracks, IPOing very early stage. I guess my you know take on that is 
holding private longer. Maybe we are speaking for ourselves because we are privately in investing in vehicles around this table. But uh, for sure, you know, it is a difficult journey sometimes to IPO very early. And Nasdaq in Stockholm is a very peculiar, peculiar um, uh, uh, listing market where I think it's the most, from a volume point of view, is the, the most vibrant early stage listing environment in Europe. So it's an alternative for a lot of very early stage companies, but it, it may get really tough to raise funds from generalists. So I guess, that, I mean, the trend now and the trend in the past was for you entrepreneurs who want to raise funds, work with the ones that you really like, because you will have to hang on to us for quite some time. And so you better choose the right parties. I know these days there are a number of new uh, flows of capital into the market, but you know, choosing those with, with um, a track record and a lot of uh, knowledge in this space will, will have an effect. I think our learnings from the past four decades is absolutely right that. Uh, you want parties around the table that understand your business, that have a blend of operating and financing uh, skill sets that can help you really bloom and, and become that category winner uh, in whatever field uh, you're in. Thank you. Well, oh, thanks, um, Patrick. You mentioned uh, the uh, uh, you know the, the uh, stock um, stock exchange. Uh, and this is one way, you know, um, you know, to, to to raise money. Another one, and then just four days ago, a hundred million dollar spec looking for a, a partner, a biotech partner by Sandy Patel from Boston BioVentures has been, you know, made public in the U.S. Um, how even if you are talking early stage, you know, we have to have you know, this this broader view. How do you see specs and IPOs as a potential exit strategy? Uh, for the day's early stage deals in the EU? Um... No, I mean, it's a highly topical question, of course. Uh, I guess, you know, it, it shows some type of temperature <laughs> on the market right now, right? So there's a, a lot of capital wanting to be deployed, not only with the within the traditional uh, remits. No, I mean, look, we were investing, for instance, in health tech, where uh, there's a, been a lot of SPACs in the US. And that's driven a lot of uh, fueling, a lot of interest from private equity firms, of course, deploying money into these type of vehicles. And also those targets that initially are acquired are then on their terms looking to, to buy uh, technology oftentimes in Europe. So absolutely, we will see ripple effects. And I think we already do that. Um, that earlier, that may, there may come earlier exit opportunities with these packs propelling, you know, bolt-on technology acquisitions by uh, SPAC vehicles in the US. I think for Europe, it's been not as hectic, but let's see how that trend uh, evolves. But for sure, I mean, it, it's a new new vehicle, it's a new phenomenon. Uh, and it's also a new set of investors sometimes that actually deploy money into these SPACs with a bit of a different, you know, view of, of, of the world and view of the market. I think, Karen, you're the only one around this table here who uh, <laughs> specs LSP at least. So how do you see it? Yeah, so we launched in January this year the first spec ever in uh, Europe, raised the 125 million. And the team is now looking for clinical stage uh, European private biotechs. And uh, if you think about all that we have talked about early and seed stage how do you see a spec you know along your value creation chain one thing is important to mention a spec is an alternative ipo so it's just another way of getting to the capital market it doesn't mean if you're not ipo ready it comes earlier you will still have to prepare the same way it's just in an ipo you market yourself to retail investors in the spec the investors come to you and ask you uh, to, to despec and do a deal. Um, so what does it change in Europe? I think what we have seen in LSP has a public fund since 2008, and we have several private funds across the spectrum, you know, diagnostics, medtech, e-health, biopharma. What we have seen is that our companies um, that we brought to the stock markets for another, another financing round to develop them further to really create value 
and this is go that goes in line with Patrick said. Um, it's not just about staying private longer. It's about creating value, value for the patients and value for the company, for the investors in there. And uh, sometimes the clinical data is exactly what you need to create value to make sure your therapy is safe and effective and um, can, can be the next market leader in your space. And how do you do that? Some, that costs a lot of money. And the stock markets are just a natural cause of that. Now, it's not always that in um, Europe, especially retail investors, so the you know, bankers, or traders that go in and out of stocks do really understand medtech or biotech investing. Uh, now everybody knows what a clinical trial is. Uh, so you can go out and say, well, you know, like it was for Moderna or BioNTech, you remember, and everybody will understand was a phase three trial but and how many patients were in there. But before that, it was very difficult. But still, retail investing on the stock markets is different. What we hope to do with our spec in Europe is to um, bring that vehicle that is absolutely booming in the US to Europe to give European companies a chance to participate in such a vehicle if the time is right and the, the setting is right for everybody and therefore participate with a 125 million financing. I think what you have seen across the spectrum is that LSP is participating in larger financing, also in private larger financing of up to 200 million euros. So just leveraging all the tools we have to support the healthcare companies we are so amazed about why we are here and doing the job we are doing and um, so how can you prepare for as, as a seed company and you hear sparks well i think we have heard that before think about the value creation the, the steps you have to go until you are at the patient and you can sell your product and think about the money you need to do uh, this development and what is the best way to, to get to that uh, money? Is it private financing or maybe talking to us back and see if it is the right time? Also, the SPAC team is always open for discussions. Thank you. Antoine, uh, uh, you are a company builder, but still, uh, I think you have done like 15 IPOs, right, with Truffle. So how do you see this? Obviously, it's a it's a it's an exit for you or a goal you want to reach with your portfolio companies. So yeah, you're right. You, we did like many IPOs, and it was part of uh, of really our process of uh, uh, providing companies with uh, substantial funding, uh, especially at uh, mid to late stage. And we've raised a, a total of half a billion uh, on the market. So not only. Uh, in IPOs, but uh, in uh, follow-on financings, which are sometimes very uh, substantial and uh, helpful for, for companies. For, so for us, an IPO is above all, it's not, of course, an exit, uh, but it's uh, a first step toward the, the exit. And I would uh, say for the, for the entrepreneur uh, and the managers of the companies, IPOs have generally uh, very good outcomes because it's a really transformational uh, step for a company that's accelerating uh, its uh, its development, its uh, strategy uh, uh, definition, and and so on, and, and and it's an opportunity to be exposed to a to to, to a large community of analysts, investors, uh, and uh, and accelerate its uh, all its de development. So uh, uh, the benefits generally is uh, is very uh, very positive for the entrepreneurs, the investors. Uh, provided that you, you can find volume and, and liquidity uh, later in the process. Uh, it's also a good uh, first step if you want to uh, to target, like build up a strategy with uh, with additional uh, uh, companies we, we, we you want to merge with or, or, or technologies you want to you want to buy with stocks. Thank you, Antoine. Anyone else would like to add? I mean, I think one of the key issues here is team. And usually the typical founder team that at least we start with would not be the team that, you know, then is preparing an IPO, right? Uh, Lionel or Jennifer, Henry. No, no, maybe a, a, a warning. Uh, no, uh, IPO in Europe. It's, as was said, no, it's not an exit, it's a financing event, that's number one. 
Number two, I warn companies to go out too early because you no, know, unless people see you no know, true value inflection points and news flow and so on, you no, know, the company goes public, the stock craters, the stock is so low that it's impossible to raise any money uh, because it's 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 worth no pennies and the volume and the liquidity is is, is nothing, and there is a, a large number of what I call you no know, zombie companies on you know, the uh, you no know, Scandinavian stock exchange on the Euronext and so on, but are really more abundant. You no, know, these are companies that were too early to go public, uh, went public and are now stuck. You no, know, they have all of the inconvenience of being public and none of the advantages. Uh, and these for me would you know our company that should have stayed no private. So I know that you no, know, it's always easy to find a banker that's you no know, uh, just looking for the next fee and take every and any company public. We've all been there, uh, but think twice. Yeah, maybe maybe to add to that, I think there's definitely a different dynamic on on U.S. stock exchanges versus European, um, and kind of the willingness to take risk and um, how early companies can be there. I think, for example, we had a Nick Sower that went public on, on Euronext as the largest medtech IPO, um, and wasn't having much liquidity or much kind of U.S. investor interest. They were mainly focused on Nasdaq companies, so went under a, a dual listing is now also listed on Nasdaq, and then it's yeah, you have the capital markets are much more available and it's a yeah i guess a challenge for european companies um to have those kind of public markets i think it was quite interesting to see also nanopore go public in in the uk um fairly recently and they had a very successful ipo and they're obviously a very kind of exciting uh, science company um so great to see them doing well so hopefully that can kind of promote more opportunities for european companies uh, Ten. I think we've been lucky in recent years that the IPO window has been open for an extended period. We're hoping that will continue because I'm sure we all have portfolio companies that are looking to IPO over the next you know, year or so. Um, but I think one of the, the cautionary um, comments is that while it has improved in medtech as it has dramatic, dramatically improved in therapeutics and the likes and a lot to what Karen has said, you know, I think healthcare resonates a lot better now. People understand clinical trials and they understand the importance of healthcare. Um, but medtech has also improved. But if you look at some of the big success stories, like say Axonix, um, I can't remember if that was a 2018 or 2019 listing. But one of the big success stories that is touted across medtech, um, but from memory, they listed post um, data submission to the FDA. So that, that's still pretty late stage. You know, when you're therapeutics, you can go a lot earlier. Um, but I would also caveat that with what Lionel has said, you know, it's all about prediction of what's coming down the tracks in the coming months. You need to be sure that you will have positive news flow and going out too early can really just um, can certainly destroy value for the for the interim period. Thank you, Jennifer. And with all the caveats, uh, let's come to one question. And this is uh, why in your experience uh, do life science startups fail? So other than you know not reaching uh, proof of concept or product market fit. So there are a couple of reasons, and maybe you can you know share with us your experience um, uh, live. Would you like to start? Sure. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll really summarize it in one word, people. It's all about people. I would rather have an amazing team with an average technology or average product than an average or no team with an amazing product. Okay. Jennifer, anything you would like to add? I think on top of people, it's in my mind, it's probably like the financing and the focus. So I think sometimes companies um, can underestimate how long it takes to raise a round, be that their first round or their second round. And they are then, you know, they cut it too short. And um, these days it can take a long time. It can take a year to close a round. So you need to firstly start the process earlier in most cases. Um, and that's, you know, the, the talking to investors and the likes and prioritizing those that are most likely to invest, but also to probably give yourself a little bit more buffer from a financing perspective, because if COVID taught us anything, it was that, um, you know, clinical trials were halted in med tech and um, enrollment was, it was slowed down dramatically. And I think we need to learn from that. And a lot of VCs focused initially on preserving their existing portfolio, which meant that they probably weren't as active in doing new deals. So we need to learn from that in the future. Um, and I think from a focus perspective, 
Often you see very early stage technologies, um, like for instance, drug delivery technologies, have strategic partnerships or collaborations, um, which can be great from a validation perspective. But I think sometimes companies can be torn in too many different directions and lack the focus on what is the core you know, market um, they should be targeting and one that has the most value and one that will be aligned to what investors want to invest in. And so I would say, you know, people, as Luna said, um, focus and then financing, just making sure you have those ticked off. Well, maybe if I may add something then to number four, um, it's uh, investor syndicate. Um, I think you no know, having a a good investor syndicate has to not only you know a fund big enough and with pockets deep enough to not only invest initially but continue to invest into the growth of the company. Having the right person you no know, from that fund on your board as an investor representative, but also having a syndicate of investors that is fully aligned so that, you know, for example, you don't have funds that are you know, making the last investment and need an exit you know, in the next three years versus you no know, a fund that makes its first investment and can wait you know, the next 10 years. Uh, so uh, investor syndicate alignment, the way to also work and collaborate, whereas directors are, or as human beings also is critical. I have seen too many companies you know fall by the wayside simply because you no, know, their board was dysfunctional, their investor syndicate was dysfunctional, and everybody's aim was completely misaligned. And that also happens. Okay. If I may add uh, another two points, I, I completely agree with the previous speakers here. But I think, I mean, if you look, uh, zoom out a bit and look in Europe, I think we're really strong in science and cutting edge science. It's, it's getting there. We're, we're good at product but we're not really good at commercial aspects so the sooner uh, bringing in uh, commercial capabilities sooner i think is a winning and my if you don't do that that you may be up for failure but if you do it earlier you actually may prevent some really really important stepping stones and that goes in therapeutic i've been in research and big pharma world myself it's interesting that phase two assets they don't even think about reimbursement in big pharma world, you do that from stage one, phase one in, in biotech. Uh, so, so, I mean, this needs to get in very, a lot sooner. Uh, and, and if you look at technology in health tech, I, I mean, it's really bringing those capabilities, figuring out uh, fairly early what the reimbursement pathway will look like. Will you build, need to build it out de novo or you, can you ride on existing reimbursement codes or pathways? Uh, so these commercial capabilities, bring the, bringing them in early and, and being open to changes to your C-suite and, and, and team generally will uh, be, I think, very important for European startups in, in life sciences. So when we stay just one second with health tech, we have a question from the audience. And uh, Roberto asks us, how do you think about IP protection digital, digital health companies? I can go here uh, since we do uh, quite a lot of investments in that space. I think IP may be playing a role in technology, um, but even more important is evidence. I think evidence is your protection, particularly if you're more of an AI type of company. If you're bundling hardware and software, of course, you can tuck some IP in on the hardware piece. But generally, IP and software is probably not you know, the strongest anyway. So clinical evidence will be, be your barrier to entry for competition and your differentiation. And I think this is also why the entire industry is looking deep into what digital therapeutics will look like. We have now a few later stage companies coming to market with, with digitally de delivered therapeutics, and that's all evidence driven. So it's no, no uh, difference to how you're evolving uh, and taking a biotech to market. Okay, thank you. Um, anybody else wants to add on that? Yeah, sure. Um, so I think for us, it's again about sustainable uniqueness, and that's probably not going to be driven by IP, but it could be something in your data set or some way you design that, but it probably just gives you a, a kind of lead of a few years as how you kind of make the most of that opportunity is it by building other moats, you know, with the customers, the evidence as you pointed out, and they're going beyond just clinical evidence and having health economic evidence, which I think is becoming uh, much more relevant and important for some of the payer systems. Uh, 
reimburse your products. And maybe there's also barriers that you can build by, by reimbursement as well. I think it's just building this kind of sustainable uniqueness and looked around the company by various uh, angles. Very good. Thank you, Henry. So um, we have uh, three minutes and 30 seconds left. And we have one more question. What is your one main tip you would give to entrepreneurs trying to raise capital in general? Very brief, I will go around the table. Everybody has one shot in 15 seconds. We start with Martin. Uh, well, uh, talk to the investors early and do your due diligence to the investors. There's a fit to the investors to your company. Thank you. Antoine? Be obsessed with your product future uh, superiority versus competitors. I know the competition very well and the future competitors as well. Thank you. Lionel? Raise enough money to reach the next infection point. So i.e. more than six months, get two or three years of cash, no secured. Thank you. Jen? Martin and Lionel robbed mine. <laughs> Go <laughs> early and raise enough. You can't be said in, a, in enough times. Thank you, Henry. Things about uh, kind of articulating why now is the right time and creating enough enough fear that the investors are going to miss out if it's uh, not now. Patrick. Yeah, I like all these comments, but I, maybe on top, really make sure what is your USP, what is your key differentiation? And I think that goes for therapeutics, medtech, health tech, symbio, bioinnovation generally. So really make that crisp to us investors why you have a long-term sustainable differentiation with your technology. So um, that I have now the most difficult job. Uh, I would add hire and involve yourself with the best team and talents you can get around you and your technology and your company. So thank you very much. I think we have one minute 40 left, Martin. Well, then uh, I think, Karen, let's wrap it up. Uh, it has been really fun talking to you uh, um, and about several topics at the SACS early stage seed investment panel. Um, um, uh, we are left there with thanking uh, Karen, Antoine, Henry, Jennifer, Lionel, and Patrick. And uh, as we have started with, we hope that we can see each other and, of course, all the people in the audience uh, latest next year uh, in Switzerland for the SACS conference in person and not digital. would be great. Yeah, would love that. Thank you so much, Martin, for hosting us. It was a pleasure. Thank you, everybody around the table. Thank you for making time. Thank you for you for listening in uh, into our digital version. And hopefully soon we see each other in person again in Switzerland. Mm -hmm.